This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Chapter 27, Part 5 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 3. After the defeat and death of the tyrant of Gaul, the Roman world was in the possession of Theodosius. He derived from the choice of Gratian his honourable title to the provinces of the East. He had acquired the West by the right of conquest, and the three years which he spent in Italy were usefully employed to restore the authority of the laws and to correct the abuses which had prevailed with impunity under the usurpation of Maximus and the minority of Valentinian. The name of Valentinian was regularly inserted in the public acts, but the tender age and doubtful faith of the son of Justina appeared to require the prudent care of an orthodox guardian, and his specious ambition might have excluded the unfortunate youth without a struggle and almost without a murmur from the administration and even from the inheritance of the empire. If Theodosius had consulted the rigid maxims of interest and policy, his conduct would have been justified by his friends, but the generosity of his behaviour on this memorable occasion has exhorted the applause of his most inveterate enemies. He seated Valentinian on the throne of Milan, and without stipulating any present or future advantages, restored him to the absolute dominion of all the provinces, from which he had been driven by the arms of Maximus. To the restitution of his ample patrimony, Theodosius added the free and generous gift of the countries beyond the Alps, which his successful valour had recovered from the assassin of Gratian. Satisfied with the glory which he had acquired by revenging the death of his benefactor and delivering the West from the yoke of tyranny, the emperor returned from Milan to Constantinople, and in the peaceful possession of the East, insensibly relapsed into his former habits of luxury and indolence. Theodosius discharged his obligation to the brother, he indulged his conjugal tenderness to the sister of Valentinian, and posterity, which admires the pure and singular glory of his elevation, must applaud his unrivalled generosity in the use of victory. The Empress Justina, did not long survive her return to Italy, and although she beheld the triumph of Theodosius, she was not allowed to influence the government of her son. The pernicious attachment to the Arian sect which Valentinian had imbibed from her example and instructions was soon erased by the lessons of a more orthodox education. His growing zeal for the faith of Nice, and his filial reverence for the character and authority of Ambrose, disposed the Catholics to entertain the most favourable opinion of the virtues of the young emperor of the west they applauded his chastity and temperance his contempt of pleasure his application to business and his tender affection for his two sisters which could not however seduce his impartial equity to pronounce an unjust sentence against the meanest of his subjects but this amiable youth before he had accomplished the twentieth year of his age, was oppressed by domestic treason, and the empire was again involved in the horrors of a civil war. Arbogastes, a gallant soldier of the nation of the Franks, held the second rank in the service of Gratian. On the death of his master, he joined the standard of Theodosius, contributed by his valour and military conduct to the destruction of the tyrant, and was appointed, after the victory, master-general of the armies of Gaul. His real merit and apparent fidelity had gained the confidence both of the prince and people. His boundless liberality corrupted the allegiance of the troops, and whilst he was universally esteemed as the pillar of the state, the bold and crafty barbarian was secretly determined either to rule or to ruin the empire of the West. The important commands of the army were distributed among the Franks. The creatures of Arbogastes were promoted to all the honours and offices of the civil government. The progress of the conspiracy removed every faithful servant from the presence of Valentinian, 
and the emperor, without power and without intelligence, insensibly sunk into the precarious and dependent condition of a captive. The indignation which he expressed, though it might arise only from the rash and impatient temper of youth, may be candidly ascribed to the generous spirit of a prince, who felt that he was not unworthy to reign. He secretly invited the Archbishop of Milan to undertake the office of a mediator, as the pledge of his sincerity and the guardian of his safety. He contrived to apprise the Emperor of the East of his helpless situation, and he declared that, unless Theodosius could speedily march to his assistance, he must attempt to escape from the palace, or rather prison, of Vienna in Gaul, where he had imprudently fixed his residence in the midst of the hostile faction. But the hopes of relief were distant and doubtful, and, as every day furnished some new provocation, the emperor, without strength or counsel, to hastily resolve to risk an immediate contest with his powerful general, he received Arbogastes on the throne, and, as the count approached with some appearance of respect, delivered to him a paper which dismissed him from all his employments. "'My authority,' replied Arbogastes, with insulting coolness, does not depend on the smile or the frown of a monarch and he contemptuously threw the paper on the ground. The indignant monarch snatched at the sword of one of the guards, which he struggled to draw from its scabbard, and it was not without some degree of violence that he was prevented from using the deadly weapon against his enemy, or against himself. A few days after this extraordinary quarrel, in which he had exposed his resentment and his weakness, the unfortunate Valentinian was found strangled in his apartment, and some pains were employed to disguise the manifest guilt of Arbogastes, and to persuade the world that the death of the young emperor had been the voluntary effect of his own despair. His body was conducted with decent pomp to the sepulchre of Milan, and the archbishop pronounced a funeral oration to commemorate his virtues and his misfortunes. On this occasion the humanity of Ambrose tempted him to make a singular breach of his theological system, and to comfort the weeping sisters of Valentinian by the firm assurance that their pious brother, though he had not received the sacrament of baptism, was introduced, without difficulty, into the mansions of eternal bliss. The prudence of Arbogastes had prepared the success of his ambitious designs, and the provincials, in whose breast every sentiment of patriotism or loyalty was extinguished, expected with tame resignation the unknown master, whom the choice of a Frank might place on the imperial throne. But some remains of pride and prejudice still opposed the elevation of Arbogastes himself, and the judicious barbarian thought it more advisable to reign under the name of some dependent Roman. He bestowed the purple on the rhetorician Eugenius, whom he had already raised from the place of his domestic secretary to the rank of master of the offices. In the course both of his private and public service, the count had always approved the attachment and abilities of Eugenius. His learning and eloquence, supported by the gravity of his manners, recommended him to the esteem of the people, and the reluctance with which he seemed to ascend the throne may inspire a favourable prejudice of his virtue and moderation. The ambassadors of the new emperor were immediately dispatched to the court of Theodosius, to communicate, with affected grief, the unfortunate accident of the death of Valentinian, and, without mentioning the name of Arbogastes, to request that the monarch of the East would embrace, as his lawful colleague, the respectable citizen who had obtained the unanimous suffrage of the armies and provinces of the West. Theodosius was justly provoked that the perfidy of a barbarian should have destroyed in a moment the labours and the fruit of his former victory, and he was excited by the tears of his beloved wife to revenge the fate of her unhappy brother, and once more to assert by arms the violated majesty of the throne. But as the second conquest of the West was a task of difficulty and danger, he dismissed with splendid presence and an ambiguous answer the ambassadors of Eugenius, and almost two years were consumed in the preparations of the civil war. 
Before he formed any decisive resolution, the pious emperor was anxious to discover the will of heaven, and, as the progress of Christianity had silenced the oracles of Delphi and Dodona, he consulted an Egyptian monk who possessed, in the opinion of the age, the gift of miracles and the knowledge of futurity. Eutropius, one of the favourite eunuchs of the palace of Constantinople, embarked for Alexandria, from whence he sailed up the Nile as far as the city of Lycopolis, or of Wolves, in the remote province of Thebes. In the neighbourhood of that city, and on the summit of a lofty mountain, the Holy John had constructed with his own hands an humble cell in which he had dwelt for above fifty years without opening his door without seeing the face of a woman, and without tasting any food that had been prepared by fire or any human art. Five days of the week he spent in prayer and meditation, but on Saturdays and Sundays he regularly opened a small window and gave audience to the crowd of suppliants who successively flowed from every part of the Christian world. The eunuch of Theodosius approached the window with respectful steps, proposed his questions concerning the event of the civil war, and soon returned with a favourable oracle, which animated the courage of the emperor by the assurance of a bloody but infallible victory. The accomplishment of the prediction was forwarded by all the means that human prudence could supply. The industry of the two master generals, Stilicho and Timasius, was directed to recruit the numbers and to revive the discipline of the Roman legions. The formidable troops of barbarians marched under the ensigns of their national chieftains, the Iberian, the Arab, and the Goth, who gazed on each other with mutual astonishment, were enlisted in the service of the same prince, and the renowned Alaric acquired in the school of Theodosius the knowledge of the art of war, which he afterwards so fatally exerted for the destruction of rome the emperor of the west or to speak more properly his general arbogastes was instructed by the misconduct and misfortune of maximus how dangerous it might prove to extend the line of defence against the skilful antagonist who was free to press or to suspend to contract or to multiply his various methods of attack Arbogastes fixed his station on the confines of Italy. The troops of Theodosius were permitted to occupy without resistance the provinces of Pannonia, as far as the foot of the Julian Alps, and even the passes of the mountains, were negligently, or perhaps artfully, abandoned to the bold invader. He descended from the hills, and beheld with some astonishment the formidable camp of the Gauls and Germans, that covered with arms and tents the open country which extends to the walls of Aquileia and the banks of the Frigidus, or Cold River. This narrow theatre of the war, circumscribed by the Alps and the Adriatic, did not allow much room for the operations of military skill. The spirit of Arbogastes would have disdained a pardon. His guilt extinguished the hope of a negotiation, and... Theodosius was impatient to satisfy his glory and revenge by the chastisement of the assassins of Valentinian. Without weighing the natural and artificial obstacles that opposed his efforts, the Emperor of the West immediately attacked the fortifications of his rivals, assigned the post of honourable danger to the Goths, and cherished a secret wish that the bloody conflict might diminish the pride and numbers of the conquerors. Ten thousand of those auxiliaries, and Bacurius, general of the Iberians, died bravely on the field of battle. But the victory was not purchased by their blood. The Gauls maintained their advantage, and the approach of night protected the disorderly flight or retreat of the troops of Theodosius. The emperor retired to the adjacent hills, where he passed the disconsolate night without sleep without provisions and without hopes, except that strong assurance which under the most desperate circumstances the independent mind may derive from the contempt of fortune and of life. The triumph of Eugenius was celebrated by the insolent and dissolute joy of his camp, whilst the active and vigilant Arbogastes 
secretly detached a considerable body of troops to occupy the passes of the mountains and to encompass the rear of the eastern army the dawn of day discovered to the eyes of theodosius the extent and the extremity of his danger but his apprehensions were soon dispelled by a friendly message from the leaders of those troops who expressed their inclination to desert the standard of the tyrant the honourable and lucrative rewards which they stipulated as the price of their perfidy were granted without hesitation and as ink and paper could not easily be procured the emperor subscribed on his own tablets the ratification of the treaty the spirit of his soldiers was revived by this seasonal reinforcement and they again marched with confidence to surprise the camp of a tyrant whose principal officers appeared to distrust either the justice or the success of his arms in the heat of the battle a violent tempest such as is often felt among the alps suddenly arose from the east the army of theodosius was sheltered by their position from the impetuosity of the wind which blew a cloud of dust in the faces of the enemy disordered their ranks wrested their weapons from their hands and diverted or repelled their ineffectual javelins this accidental advantage was skilfully improved the violence of the storm was magnified by the superstitious terrors of the gauls and they yielded without shame to the invisible powers of heaven who seemed to militate on the side of the pious emperor his victory was decisive and the deaths of his two rivals were distinguished only by the difference of their characters the rhetorician eugenius who had almost acquired the dominion of the world was reduced to implore the mercy of the conqueror and the unrelenting soldiers separated his head from his body as he lay prostrate at the feet of theodosius arbogastes after the loss of a battle in which he had discharged the duties of a soldier and a general wandered several days among the mountains but when he was convinced that his cause was desperate and his escape impracticable the intrepid barbarian imitated the example of the ancient romans and turned his sword against his own breast the fate of the empire was determined in a narrow corner of italy and the legitimate successor of the house of valentinian embraced the archbishop of milan and graciously received the submission of the provinces of the west those provinces were involved in the guilt of rebellion while the inflexible courage of ambrose alone had resisted the claims of successful usurpation with a manly freedom which might have been fatal to any other subject the archbishop rejected the gifts of eugenius declined his correspondence and withdrew himself from milan to avoid the odious presence of a tyrant whose downfall he predicted in discreet and ambiguous language the merit of ambrose was applauded by the conqueror who secured the attachment of the people by his alliance with the church and the clemency of theodosius is ascribed to the humane intercession of the archbishop of milan after the defeat of eugenius the merit as well as the authority of theodosius was cheerfully acknowledged by all the inhabitants of the roman world the experience of his past conduct encouraged the most pleasing expectations of his future reign and the age of the emperor which did not exceed fifty years seemed to extend the prospect of the public felicity his death only four months after his victory was considered by the people as an unforeseen and fatal event which destroyed in a moment the hopes of the rising generation but the indulgence of ease and luxury had secretly nourished the principles of disease the strength of theodosius was unable to support the sudden and violent transition from the palace to the camp and the increasing symptoms of a dropsy announced the speedy dissolution of the emperor the opinion and perhaps the interest of the public had confirmed the division of the eastern and western empires and the two royal youths arcadius and honorius who had already obtained from the tenderness of their father the title of augustus 
were destined to fill the thrones of Constantinople and of Rome. Those princes were not permitted to share the danger and glory of the civil war. But as soon as Theodosius had triumphed over his unworthy rivals, he called his younger son Honorius to enjoy the fruits of the victory and to receive the scepter of the West from the hands of his dying father. The arrival of Honorius at Milan was welcomed by a splendid exhibition of the games of the circus, and the emperor, though he was oppressed by the weight of his disorder, contributed by his presence to the public joy. But the remains of his strength were exhausted by the painful effort which he made to assist at the spectacles of the morning. Honorius supplied, during the rest of the day, the place of his father, and the great Theodosius expired in the ensuing night, notwithstanding the recent animosities of a civil war, his death was universally lamented. The barbarians, whom he had vanquished, and the churchmen, by whom he had been subdued, celebrated, with loud and sincere applause, the qualities of the deceased emperor, which appeared the most valuable in their eyes. The Romans were terrified by the impending dangers of a feeble and divided administration, and every disgraceful moment of the unfortunate reigns of Arcadius and Honorius revived the memory of their irreparable loss. In the faithful picture of the virtues of Theodosius, his imperfections have not been dissembled. The act of cruelty and the habits of indolence, which tarnished the glory of one of the greatest of the Roman princes, an historian perpetually adverse to the fame of Theodosius has exaggerated his vices and their pernicious effects. He boldly asserts that every rank of subjects imitated the effeminate manners of their sovereign, and that every species and corruption polluted the course of public and private life, and that the feeble restraints of order and decency were insufficient to resist the progress of that degenerate spirit which sacrifices without a blush the consideration of duty and interest to the base indulgence of sloth and appetite. The complaints of contemporary writers, who deplore the increase of luxury and deprivation of manners, are commonly expressive of their peculiar temper and situation. There are few observers who possess a clear and comprehensive view of the revolutions of society, and who are capable of discovering the nice and secret springs of action which impel, in the same uniform direction, the blind and capricious passions of a multitude of individuals. If it can be affirmed, with any degree of truth, that the luxury of the Romans was more shameless and dissolute in the reign of Theodosius than in the age of Constantine, perhaps, or of Augustus, the alteration cannot be ascribed to any beneficial improvements, which had gradually increased the stock of natural riches. A long period of calamity or decay must have checked the industry and diminished the wealth of the people, and their profuse luxury must have been the result of that indolent despair which enjoys the present hour and declines the thoughts of futurity. The uncertain condition of their property discouraged the subjects of Theodosius from engaging in those useful and laborious undertakings which require an immediate expense and promise a slow and distant advantage. The frequent examples of ruin and desolation tempted them not to spare the remains of a patrimony which might every hour become the prey of the rapacious Goth, and the mad prodigality which prevails in the confusion of a shipwreck or a siege may serve to explain the progress of luxury amidst the misfortunes and terrors of a sinking nation. The effeminate luxury which infected the manners of courts and cities had instilled a secret and destructive poison into the camps of the legions, and their degeneracy has been marked by the pen of a military writer who had accurately studied the genuine and ancient principles of Roman discipline. It is the just and important observation of Vegetius that the infantry was invariably covered with defensive armour from the foundation of the city to the reign of the Emperor Gratian. The relaxation of discipline and the disuse of exercise 
rendered the soldiers less able and less willing to support the fatigues of the service. They complained of the weight of the armour which they seldom wore, and they successively obtained the permission of laying aside both their cuirasses and their helmets. The heavy weapons of their ancestors, the short sword and the formidable pilum, which had subdued the world, insensibly dropped from their feeble hands. As the use of the shield is incompatible with that of the bow, they reluctantly marched into the field, condemned to suffer either the pains of wounds or the ignominy of flight, and always disposed to prefer the more shameful alternative. The cavalry of the Goths, the Huns, and the Alani had felt the benefits and adopted the use of defensive armour, and as they excelled in the management of missile weapons, they easily overwhelmed the naked and trembling legions whose heads and breasts were exposed without defence to the arrows of the barbarians. The loss of armies, the destruction of cities, and the dishonour of the Roman name ineffectually solicited the successors of Gratian to restore the helmets and the cuirasses of the infantry. The enervated soldiers abandoned their own and the public defence, and their pusillanimous indolence may be considered as the immediate cause of the downfall of the empire. End of chapter 27, part 5